You know, we take a lot for granted when it comes to the internet. With the World Wide Web being essential for many of our lives, and providing any type of information with just a simple search, it's quite easy to forget to take a step back and see the web for what it truly is. Just another place for advertisements to get shoved in your face, and for companies to get personal details about you. A place where content is locked behind a contract that usually sells your soul away. Don't get me wrong, the web isn't the main issue here, however it does enable it. What if I told you that I recently encountered a new area of the internet, one in which information is free, without contracts, that won't invade your privacy, an area that should have been what we know as the web. Hold it right there. This would be the part where I insert some form of speech about how you should subscribe, show the viewers subscribe to not subscribe ratio, and thank you for your support. I'm not going to do any of that, because I just did. Let's get to this interesting story. Before we can talk about this amazing area of the internet, we gotta talk about how the web came to be. Trust me, it's quite relevant. You see, there was this British man named Tim Berners-Lee. I'll be calling him Tim, because that's shorter. Long story short, Tim, with the help of his co-workers at CERN, a scientific lab in Switzerland, developed what we know as HTTP, or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and released it to the public in 1992. HTTP is what we use to connect to the web today. You know that HTTPS you see in the browser when you visit a web page? It usually has a padlock on it saying that you're secure or something like that? Yeah, that was developed by Tim. Well, not exactly. You see, HTTPS is a more secure version of HTTP, but that's a whole nother story for another day. Just remember that Tim is responsible for the same way we communicate with websites even to this day. Now, why would this be important to the rest of the story? Now this is where it gets interesting. You see, HTTP was not the only thing being developed at this time. People hard at work over at the University of Minnesota, namely these people, were developing Gopher, an internet protocol which sort of resembled the web, but obviously wasn't the web. The difference between the web and Gopher was that Gopher's syntax was super simple and emphasized on menu systems, where you could open a menu and have access to all the documents in said menu, pretty much how folders work. In fact, the name Gopher comes from the University of Minnesota's mascot, which was a gopher, and the fact that gophers are assistants who go for things. Don't quote me on that, I stole it from Wikipedia. The content that a gopher server returned was all text-based, making it very friendly for the command line, which is how most people used gopher. When gopher launched in 1991, servers quickly sprung up. However, remember how I said HTTP was released to the public in 1992? Yeah, it wasn't long until people found popularity with HTTP over Gopher. It really didn't do the developers any good when they changed their licensing and wanted to charge fees for setting up and maintaining Gopher servers. However, this quickly got lots of backlash and they changed it to the GNU license, which essentially turned it into free software. This caused even more bad publicity for the protocol and in the end, it lost the word HTTP. Now, I cannot find documented proof on this, however, while exploring Gopher in my free time, I came across a document that talked about how the developers of Gopher blamed the loss of popularity due to the fact that you could serve ads as well as explicit content with HTTP, while that was nearly not as available on Gopher. I cannot verify the users who posted this, so do with this information as you wish. After I found Gopher, I was eager to get on and explore it. However, I soon found out that I couldn't just use a normal web browser. While add-ons do exist, like Overbyte, most browsers just don't support this protocol. So I decided to go with a browser dedicated for this called LagRange. It's a browser that supports both Gopher and Gemini protocol. Don't worry about Gemini, just think of it like a middle ground between Gopher and the web. In fact, their tagline is heavier than Gopher, lighter than the web, will not replace either. After exploring some documentation, I found myself going to Floodgap server. Floodgap was a great hub, full of a bunch of wealth of information, including links to pretty much every known Gopher server, search functions, and popular links. Floodgap also has a normal website which includes a Gopher proxy, so you can search Gopher without even needing to download a client, although I don't recommend it as it sort of defeats the purpose. Among one of these popular links piqued my interest, SDF. I have operated on Gopher for about a week now, and I can say that SDF has become like my second home. 
The SDF stands for the Super Dimension Fortress, and has been around since 1987 as a sort of hub of things. They're actually a non-profit and earn their funds through donations. It's a place where people can communicate and learn from one another. It's a no-brainer why SDF would have a gopher server, and I'm glad they do. On their server, you can find the gopher space, a place where anyone who hosts a gopher site with SDF, which is over 4,000 people, with over 1,500 of them being active within the last five years, can have their site listed in a directory for everyone else to see. I actually host my own site there, which includes a flog. Think of it like a blog, just with a fancier name. I'll leave a link to my gopher site in the description below. Now, while I love gopher to death, it just cannot be used for a main source of information like how the web is. I found myself constantly working with both the web and gopher, and a major reason for that is simple. The lack of people. Because the web has dominated the space, all of the information that gets published goes over there, while a lot of the information you find on gopher is people's personal experience in the form of vlogs. You can find useful information on gopher, but it is just simpler to use the web. That sparks the question. Why even use it? People have their varied reasons for using Gopher. Either it's because they reject the idea of the web, or it's just from nostalgia. For me, it's a little bit of both. While I never heard of Gopher before, the fact of having an old protocol that was different from the web highly piqued my interest, and over time it turned into a peaceful place to learn about other people and their experiences without all the nuances like ads uh, that you would typically find on the web. Add the fact that SDF made it stupid easy to find everyone flogging in one group, and you can just see how easy it was to constantly find new content to read. Gopher will always have a place in my heart as a valuable protocol, and I'm quite disappointed it's not more popular. After all, protocols like this depend on users actually sharing data for it to be valued and worthwhile. I highly encourage you to try out Gopher. The more people, the better, right? A world without advertisements in your face, companies tracking your every move, it almost sounds too good to be true. And yet it's right here, hidden under the web, tossed away to be forgotten by most. It's kind of ironic. Gopher doing what it does best, hiding underground. I hope you enjoyed this video. I spent a lot of time on it, but it was just a topic I couldn't pass up. I do think that's all for now. If I missed anything, do not hesitate to scream at me in the comments. For now, take care. Yeah.